Yes, yes, it's Uncle Jegs. And in today's video, we're going to be looking at the foods test required practical. I'll be doing my best not to pepper the script with a lot of food references. Don't get mad salty, yeah? So, in this video, we'll be looking at number one, qualitative versus quantitative data. Number two, techniques that you're going to use in the experiment. Number three, the test for starch. Number four, the test for sugars. Number five, the test for lipids. And finally, number six, the test for proteins. As always, check out the description with the timestamps there. And while you're down there, check out the worksheet for today's lesson and also the answers to last week's lesson. All right, let's dig into this. Many of us suffer from food allergies or are trying out a specific diet to stay healthy. It is therefore important to know exactly what you're eating, yeah? Most times, if you have a food allergy, your immune system is thinking the food that you're eating is the ops. And so, it runs amok in your body. Like hay fever, the pollen isn't actually doing anything, it's your immune system beating yourself up. The food tests that you do in school are a type of qualitative test. Here's the difference between quantitative and qualitative tests. Quantitative data is usually in the form of numbers and this is because you're usually measuring something with it. Qualitative data is usually in the form of words, that's because it's usually some sort of description. In the foods test, you're essentially mainly looking out for colour change or if there's a layer forming somewhere. So it's a yes or no answer, it's a description of something. Now, if you were to measure the time it took for the solution to go cloudy enough for you not to see an X on a white tile, then this will be quantitative. To perform the food test, you need to know the best way to use a pestle and mortar, filtration and a water bath. First, with the pestle and mortar. First things first, which one is the pestle and which one is the mortar? I had no clue up until writing this sentence. I had to Google that, so yeah, the pestle comes from the Latin word for pounder. Clearly, that's this thing here. I saw the mortar is the bowl. You're actually extra, you know. How so? You're trying to tell us how to smash things up. I think we all know how to smash things up. Ooh, so you know everything, yeah? Bet you didn't know this. You're actually meant to sprinkle some sand into your mortar to help you crush some of your tougher foods. Sand is ideal because it's hard and unreactive. So if your food is being a little naughty, don't be salty. Sprinkle some sand, bae. Cool. The next one is filtration, which uses a special paper called a filter paper. Now, I don't have any filter paper at home, so I had to just use regular paper, allow me. This is a, has very small gaps inside it that allows dissolved substances to move through it, while your larger insoluble substances stay up here. The liquid that filters through is called your filtrate. The first step here is to get your filter paper and fold it in half, and then fold it in half again like this. Now this next bit is critical. Open it up so you make a cone with no gap in the middle. Then it goes into your funnel and the whole thing sits on your conical flask. The final one is the water bath. Now if your principle is a boiler, a shot caller, you may just have those big water baths that you can just press the temperature you need and wait for the water to get to that temperature. But all isn't lost if your school isn't living it up like that, yeah? Just boil some water in a kettle, put that water in a beaker and voila! A very inefficient water bath. But since we're um, constantly losing thermal energy into the surrounding, but it's good enough for food tests, so don't stress too much. And speaking of food tests, let's look at how these are done. The quickest test is the iodine test. If you watched my previous video on enzymes, you'll remember that to test for starch, we use iodine. Iodine is normally a orangey red color, but when you add it to starch, it goes this purplish black color. This test will come out positive for any of these yummy foods here. Rice, bread, biscuit, pasta, noodles, potatoes, you name it. Now, before we test the sugars, let's just make sure we are all cool with the definitions, yeah? Carbohydrates. 
carbon that is hydrated. Remember that water is H2O. Let's look at a formula that you're meant to learn. That's for glucose, yeah? Glucose is C6H12O6. For every one carbon and oxygen, you have two hydrogens, H2O. Glucose, of course, is used in aerobic respiration in plants and animals. Plants store glucose as starch and animals store it as glycogen. The sugar test is also called the Benedict's test because the reagent that we're using is called Benedict's solution. A reagent is just a fancy name for a substance used in a chemical reaction. It has a lot of copper 2 ions floating around inside it. These copper ions, as you'll remember from your making salts practical, we're gonna get onto that video soon, that gives you a blue color. Remember oil rig stands for oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. When the copper ions are reduced, so when they gain an electron, they form copper one ions. The color then changes from a blue to a brickish red or a yellow color if you don't have a lot of sugar present. These electrons come from your sugar and for these reasons, they're called reducing sugars. Because they are reducing things, oil rig reduction is gain. Anyway, here are the steps. Number one, you grind your food with your pestle and mortar. Number two, you add your food to a beaker with distilled water. Number three, you store it so that your, some of your food is dissolved. Number four, you then filter using your filter paper and funnel and conical flask. Number five, you add some of your filtrate into a new test tube. Number six, you add 10 drops of your Benedict solution to the test tube. Number seven, Half fill a beaker with hot water from the kettle and leave it for five minutes. Number eight, if you have sugars, then you would notice the color change. Take some of your filtrate left over and add it to some iodine. If it goes blackish purple, then obviously you also had starch present in the food. Some safety precautions here, yeah? Always wear your goggles, obviously, and dry any spillages on your surface or on your body and be careful of the hot liquids yet. Now I've seen two tests for lipids. The first I'll go over is called the emulsions test. This relies on the fact that water and lipids aren't friendly with each other. But a molecule like ethanol, which can interact with both the water and the lipid, can bring them together in small balls-like structures called emulsions. What you do for the emulsions test is this. Number one, you add your sample, this is usually in a liquid form, into a test tube. Number two, you add your ethanol and shake it well. The sample you should notice will dissolve with no issue. Number three, you add water and then if fats, lipids, um, oils are present, then you will notice that the solution goes cloudy due to the emotions scattering the light in the solution. The next test is the Sudan Free Test. That name is so dope, Sudan Free. Sounds like a video game, a retro video game. Anyway, you use this when you need to crush your food. The first step, you crush your food obviously with the pestle and mortar. Number two, your food is then added to a beaker with some distilled water. You stir it not again. Number three, you stir it so that some of the food is dissolved. Number four, you half fill your test tube with the dissolved solution. Number five, you add three drops of your Sudan free stain and mix it gently. If lipids are present, you will notice that there's a layer of red that floats to the top of your test tube. That is the positive test for lipids, yeah? Using the Sudan free. Some safety precautions for this experiment. You're using ethanol, which is highly flammable, so make sure that there aren't any naked flames around. What, uncle? Did you just say naked? Yes, naked as in something that isn't covered, so a flame that's not covered. Anyway, make sure you have your safety goggles on. And finally, last but not the least, it's the proteins. This is the burette test, yeah? Don't get it twisted with the Benedict's test. So for this test, number one, you get your pistol and mortar, and you pistol and mortar your food. Number two, you add your beaker and some distilled water. 
Then number three, you stir your food so that some of the food is dissolved. Number four, you're filtering the solution so that your filtrate is as clear as possible. Number five, you add three centimeters cubed of your filtrate into a test tube. Number six, you add three centimeters cubed of your burette solution and then shake it gently. If it goes pink or purple, then you've got proteins in your solution. Safety precautions. This involves the use of sodium hydroxide, which is an irritant, and also copper sulfate, which can be toxic. So any spillages on your skin needs to be washed away ASAP. Obviously have your safety goggles on. Here's some summary notes on all of that Yeah, Pause the video if you need to, and we'll wrap this all up. Actually, yeah, before I go, let me just bait out one of the baitest questions that they can ask you about foods test. They could ask you what's your main sources of error in this investigation, yeah? I hold up my hands and say I'm terrible at judging colours, so it can be pretty difficult. You might find it yourself trying to judge when the colour is changing and when you're actually done. So yeah, I just remember that's the biggest question that could, they could ask you in this one, yeah. But yeah, that's all I got time for. Like if you like this, subscribe if I'm necessary for you and in a bit.